A small support group on the communications platform Slack created to help connect recovering COVID-19 patients with questions about the disease has turned into a massive research effort to study any potentially lingering symptoms. The group called Patient-Led Research for COVID-19 gathered information from more than 600 respondents in the first report of its kind and are hoping the critical data they amass will help doctors better understand the impact of COVID and treat patients with long-lasting symptoms. With me now for more on this report is Tanya Basu. She is the senior reporter at MIT Technology Review covering the intersection of humans and technology. Tanya, thanks so much for joining us. So explain how this group started and what the creators were looking for when they made this Slack channel. Sure. Um, so the group was actually a media company independent of the coronavirus before it started. And the founder, Fiona Lowenstein, got sick with coronavirus back in March. Um, thought Instagram would be the easiest way to inform her followers and anyone she had come in contact with that she was sick. That launched a bunch of comments that made WhatsApp a smarter choice for her to communicate with people. That in turn also exploded and they launched a Slack group. Um, part of that Slack group was just to connect people who were suffering from coronavirus. And a subgroup was launched under that uh, where people who had long haul um, coronavirus, which is people who have been suffering with coronavirus for weeks, often months on end, were able to connect and study themselves. So how is this research being conducted and what does it tell us about our current understanding of coronavirus patients? Yeah, um, so they're studying themselves, as I mentioned, and they don't necessarily work with hospitals or anything. Right now, doctors in America are overwhelmed and still dealing with the novel coronavirus, trying to understand what it is. Um, we are still not exactly sure how it works. We're learning every single day how it affects people, and long haulers are often missing getting tested. Um, a lot of these doctors are starting to study people who have been tested positive, but as we know in the U.S., testing is not necessarily uh, working, and people aren't able to access testing at the rates that they'd like to. So a lot of these people are just answering surveys online and trying to understand themselves. Why are they still feeling sick? Why do they have neurological issues? Why are they um, still breathing hard? A lot of the people I spoke to are so exhausted that they can't speak for more than 20 to 30 minutes at a time. They are breathless. They are often um, still unable to get out of the house. They are still quarantining. And this is often for people who are you know, in day 135, for example. So what stood out to you in this report? And were the leaders of the group able to find any trends or consistencies in the symptoms left behind by coronavirus? Yeah, what stood out to me was the fact that a lot of these people were starting to experience neurological issues. Um, they often described as brain fog, um, which meant that what seemed to be the connecting issue here was that they were formally able to think or react quickly, and they weren't necessarily able to do so. One woman told me that her thinking ability was so slowed down that she couldn't understand basic sitcoms. She actually had to watch children's cartoons because the basic storyline there made much more sense as was not as stressful as something as even as simple as a sitcom. Um, a lot of people also talked a lot about, uh, like I said, G uh, neurological issues. There were GI issues. Often people were unable to eat or keep food down. Um, I think what stood out to me was the fact that a lot of these people were experiencing very similar symptoms to people who actually reported being tested positive. And there were often false negatives that were reported. They were often told that they didn't have coronavirus, that they were free from the coronavirus, yet they were displaying symptoms of coronavirus. Um, so what stood out to me in that respect was that it seems like we're not necessarily getting the testing in this country that we need to have done. And the testing that is being done is often wrong. Fascinating. So your piece not only focuses on the physical suffering from COVID, but also the loneliness some patients feel from experiencing these symptoms without a doctor or friends uh, that can help, you know, that can relate. So why is the mental health aspect of a recovered coronavirus patient so important for this group? And how does it impact their experience of these lingering symptoms? Yeah, um, I mean, think about how we're all, you know, being right now, we're all quarantined, we're all isolated. And when you are sick with coronavirus, you are even more so isolated, often 
told not to go outside in any sense, in any way. And a lot of people have been told by doctors that they're imagining these symptoms, that they're um, potentially psychosomatic or anxious, and often told that they are not really suffering from coronavirus. Um, so that is often an issue, and it makes it very hard for these people to connect with others. Slack groups like this are very important in terms of not only making them feel not insane, but also able to connect with others and know that their experience is validated and real and that there's other people around the world who are supporting them. You also noted some flaws in the report in your article. The overwhelming response to the survey has been uh, from cis white women, but we know this virus affects black and Hispanic communities disproportionately. The survey also saw an overwhelming response from the United States. Is there anything being done to include people of color or countries outside of the US? Yeah, that's their next step and they recognize those flaws. And I think given that it's a Slack group, that's both a good and a bad thing. A great thing in that anyone can join around the world, but also a bad thing in that unless you are aware of how Slack works or the way the network you know, just operates, it's very hard to access. For example, if you're an older person, getting onto Slack is a very difficult thing. Um, and understanding the sort of nuances of communicating on Slack and the group culture on Slack can be hard to understand and hard to learn. Um, and like you mentioned, Black and Hispanic people are overwhelmingly suffering from coronavirus, and they're not necessarily the people who are accessing Slack at the highest rates. Um, so opening that survey up to people who aren't necessarily fluent in lang the language of Slack and the community of Slack is very important to them and probably important to our understanding of long haul. Really, really fascinating reporting. Uh, Tanya Basu, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you.